Welcome, a listener, to another episode of Spam, Spam, Spam Humbug. This is episode 139 of the podcast, and we have another wide-ranging episode for you. It starts off with Helgriff Dragon we had on the podcast again. Welcome back, Helgriff. Golden Flame also joined in as well. And then, of course, there was myself. And the conversation initially ranged over topics like um, <laughs> the Lego movie, Batman, whether it would be awesome to have like William Shatner as Batman with Mark Hamill reprising his role as the Joker, given how they like to riff on each other on uh, Twitter sometimes. Talk a little bit about uh, how to like play Dungeons and Dragons remotely. Some other movies that we've seen kind of just over the course of the last few months. And then we dive down a bit of a Star Wars rabbit hole. We talk about The Mandalorian and Dave Filoni and The Clone Wars. We talk about video conferencing apps and scaling or the lack of some of these apps to, uh, in terms of supporting good scaling. We talk about Zoom and Zoom security and we talk about games we've been playing. Um, you know, I've been checking out Halo, the Master Chief Collection, a few other games. We talk a little bit about a really cool thing that at the time hadn't yet happened to my wife. It has since happened. It's kind of cool. And then much of the back half of the episode is actually the Golden Flame Dragon show when he talks a lot about the Dark Unknown and the progress he's been making on the Dark Unknown, his Ultima-inspired uh, tile-based RPG. We'll talk about some of the challenges he's faced, you know, especially with the transition to everybody working from home. Um, he talks, you know, a lot about the need to rely on others for help, for feedback, for input, um, which kind of leads into a broader discussion of, you know, are the things that we build really built solely by us? And there's some cybersecurity talk in there too, because, you know, I did actually manage to make this recording. So there you have it. Of course, as always, we are hosted on Anchor.fm, newer, more social podcast hosting platform. You can find us at Anchor.fm slash SSSH podcast or at spam, 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 humbug.com. Anchor has an app. And if you are listening to us in the Anchor app, do consider liking our episodes or liking the whole podcast or sharing the episodes with your social media circles. And of course, as always, a hearty thank you to our Patreon donors, patreon.com slash Ultima Codex. If you would like to join that hearty crew, you are the ones who keep the podcast and the Codex going by your support. And especially a thank you to our co-producers, Seth, Golden Flame, Chris, Dominic, Violation, Cranberry, Christopher, Bruce, Dark Wraith Dragon, Helgruff, Gronk, Pascal, and Thor One. All right, that's enough for me. Let's get on with the show. So yeah, honestly, I uh, I did not have a topic. Well, when do I ever have a topic? Wait, up? wait, I was going to say, how is this different? Yeah, I know, right? When I've do been, I ever I've, have a topic? I, I've been away for months and I still remember this. Yeah. Uh, I will say it's... Oh, go on. I was going to say, it's, just, it's, a, it's a podcast largely featuring dragons. Of course we wing it. Yep, pretty much. Ah, nice pun, by the way. I like uh, it's always fun when when it, when it hits on a delay trigger slides by go. at first and then three seconds later wait a minute <laughs> oh you did that well wing it that's a bad pun there are no bad puns no I think that was a uh, it was a Lego movie right almost like, well, how are we gonna get across well wing it yes that was a bad pun yes I can't I can't do that Lego Lego Batman is awesome yes yes he is very well played. It's pretty great. <laughs> just self-aware enough and just over the top enough. He's not quite Shatley. He's not quite. Um, my God, his name has gone out of my head. William Shatner. Or yeah. Adam West. No, no, Adam West. Because I knew but William Shatner wasn't the right name. Although William Shatner Batman would be a sight to be seen. I have to say, man. <laughs> uh, that would be. I would. Be I would good. love that if. We could get Mark Hamill in to reprise his Joker so that we could have Shatner and Hamill, the heads of two of the greatest sci-fi franchises, doing something completely not sci-fi together. Uh, well, yeah. You know, they spar a fair bit. on. Well, they've sparred occasionally on Twitter, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah they've, uh, they've thrown down. They've thrown, they've thrown hands a few times verbally. <laughs> so it would be, you know, now they could just do that. Yeah. In, in, in Here, the you now you now have fifty two minutes to do this. <laughs> we need to save the rest of the the rest of the time for the actual plot. Yeah. I still haven't Watch seen Lego one. Movie Two, but I need to. 
it's mm, I would I would rate Lego Movie One better. That's um, about the gist of what I've heard. I haven't it's, actually seen it myself yet either. I mean, Lego Movie One was pretty amazing, so it's not like if it misses that bar, it's not it's necessarily a, worth time. It's a, it's not necessarily that it's bad. It's just that's a pretty high bar to clear. <laughs> yeah, though Lego Batman did clear it. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> that, well, was a, they, that was a pretty they, amazing. They, movie. They, they they took what was almost the singular best character from the Lego Movie <laughs> and spun yeah. him out. Yeah. And they, yeah, they did well by it. Lego Movie Two, like I mean. There, there's a lot of actually there's a lot of good beats in lego movie 2 um and i mean batman again is just scene stealing when he's there uh and the 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 new song um i actually really enjoyed the way they introduced the new song the it's called catchy song and i mean it is <laughs> like you know it is such an like it just oh my gosh it just burrows into your skull like it's just it it lives up to its name. It really does. G- nice. Gentlemen, we have improved the earwig process. Oh Behold. my gosh! Behold! But, but what's cool about it is, at least my experience taking my daughters to go see it was like you know we we're watching along fine, and you know the way that they introduced the song in the movie, it was kind of this. My experience of it was sort of this like, oh okay, like they're switching up the soundtrack, and then sort of this realization through a lens of dawning horror that you know this was the new everything is awesome that was about to be inflicted upon us and, and it was going to it in your house over and over and over yes. again now and it was they, even they, peppier <laughs> they 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 set it up so you saw the train coming and could do nothing about it yes it was it was so well teed up in the movie it was really well done in that respect and you know then yes it did kind of become the the house soundtrack for months thereafter until my son took a disliking to it. He, uh, huh. now he likes, he likes, he still likes everything is awesome from the original Lego movie. And then he likes the, um, the downbeat reprise of everything is awesome. That is also on the Lego movie Two soundtrack, hmm. but he does not like catchy song. So lucky you. <laughs> yes. But yeah, they, they also revisit everything is awesome, but in kind of a, a refutational way. So <laughs> That was, uh, that was, was that, well, I guess that, that was the last movie I would have taken the kids to see in the theater. And then the last movie I saw in theater was Rise of Skywalker. Um, not that I go to the movies that much anyways. Yeah, me either. Being, you know, busy and <laughs> all of those good things. But, uh. Rise might have been the last one I was in theaters for as well. I yeah, can't I really think. Right. Yeah. Not that I can't think of much that's come up that I've been like, ooh, ah, I got to see that. Maybe at some point. Frozen 2. My kids went and saw Frozen 2, but that was my wife that took them. So, And now that's on Disney+. Plus. So, haha. That one, that one I saw on an airplane. I have not seen that one uh, yet entirely. Although I'm told that uh, I, I will greatly enjoy like Kristoff's uh, role in the movie. Uh, I've had a couple of people point, uh, say, you know, you should, you should watch it. You'd really like what they do with Kristoff. Me, personally, I would like what they do with Kristoff. Okay. Well, good to know. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, now we find out how well they really know you. Yeah, well, yeah. maybe. I don't know. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, you uh, won't come out of it and go, excuse me, I am now offended. I didn't realize yeah, I was being stealth insulted this whole time. Excuse me, you were wrong. You were wrong yeah. on so many levels, it's hard for me to understand how wrong you were. <laughs> yes, but I will now present you the list. Would you like it alphabetized or in order of priority? <laughs> chronologically <laughs> yes the various realizations i have made about your deficiencies in understanding me as a human being arranged chronologically for your listening pleasure ah no i don't know yeah I, we were, I, we were said act you know even then like we we actually held off getting disney plus until i can't even remember what it was my my wife made some sort of deal with with the girls that if this that or the other thing transpired then it's like okay well we can get disney plus at least for a month and uh you know you can check out frozen 2 and of course then we got sucked into the orbit of the mandalorian because baby yoda is cute and my wife is the sort of lady who you know always ends up holding the baby at a party right in addition yeah. to the four of our own that we've had so uh <laughs> yeah like we're doomed yeah. Pretty, pretty much pretty much guaranteed that we were going to get sucked in by that one some people have sleeve dogs. Apparently, she has sleeve baby. Mm, oh, she loves babies. 
And I mean, to be fair, like Baby Yoda is pretty standout cute, right? Although I yeah. was rereading today, I was rereading today the the story of um, of uh, you know how Werner Herzog um, was like adamant that the directors of the show not opt to um because like they did the scenes they shot the scenes with the baby yoda puppet but then they wanted to reshoot the scenes without the puppet in case they you know needed to cgi uh cgi baby yoda in instead and and Werner herzog basically just got on their case and was just like no like this is amazing technology you know <laughs> You know, don't be, you know, that, that was his big, he's like, don't be cowards. Just, you have an amazing thing here. Like, this is a technical masterpiece. Use it. Don't be afraid of it. Um, and apparently, like, on set, he would treat the puppet like a real actor. So, like, he would be, you know, he would, like, just talk to it, and he would give it, like, you know, tips. Like, <laughs> acting tips, or, like, you know, just, like, tips on how to move in the scene. Um <laughs> I mean, he, he's a he's a documentarian and a director from from way back, um, sure. and so you know, like it's just uh, probably kind of natural for him to just fall into it, right because he's directed so many things of his own in addition to being an actor. Um, but just you know, kind of one of those hilarious stories that came out of the the, the shooting of that particular series. Um, it's really well done. But then I like Dave Filoni. Any anything Dave Filoni touches, I just I so enjoy. Um, you know, like this is who was like the mastermind for the clone wars and he did rebels and he was behind the resistance cartoon um okay when you say clone wars i'm guessing you mean the long running series not like the 10 part mini series they did initially uh, yeah the well it's now wrapping up season seven so yes yeah and then rebels was another four seasons and then resistance was two or three seasons um yeah, I ended up catching a bunch of it, a bunch of bunches of it in essentially uh, YouTube dig- digestion size clips. Well, you know, the only thing that's weird about the Clone Wars, if you do ever want to like binge the entire series, is that the first two, two and a half seasons are not in chronological order. Yeah, they play, that, uh, they play that trick. <laughs> yeah, they they do it in a very vignetted kind of way, it's like you know, every episode own little story. Um, they're chronologically quite out of order and so you'll kind of like you'll see it'll stick with events for maybe a couple of episodes but then it'll jump away remember from like half a season ago it's Uh, basically scenes from a war yeah there was okay i don't Uh, know if it's (laughs) universal or if it's just you but you you, your your voice just went totally oddly for about the last i heard it as well (laughs) Okay, well, I'll make a note, and uh, we'll see if uh, I need to clean that part out. It's entirely possible. I'm trying the new, um, because of course, you know, I'm solo parenting my wife. She's a... There it is again. (laughs) Yeah, that didn't come through at all. It sounds like bandwidth issues or something. It's like, I started using, and then suddenly, cronk. Like some sort of weird, like it's not even like a voice. It's like it's almost like like old school, like nineteen uh, eighties videos, computerized voices, but you ah. can't really make out the words. <laughs> Crazy. Is this better? Yes, for now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. For whatever reason, my uh... and you're kicking oh. again. No, no, I actually literally just paused. Oh, okay. Um... Yeah, I literally just paused to, to yeah. No, I uh, for whatever reason yeah, for whatever reason all of a sudden my like my disc my my signal, my Wi Fi signal shows as strong, but my Discord signal bars went to like red line, so whatever. I don't know. Yeah, um, I saw my voice connection bars drop down to like yellow and red briefly, like earlier mm-hmm. before anyone else is on the channel. But <laughs> but for the most part it's been good since then. Yeah. So I don't know. Anyways, where was I? Um so I'm I it yeah, whatever. Uh, Pause, but, rewind, reinitiate. <laughs> pretty much. But yeah, I did. So, and actually on StarWars.com, I found this years ago. And um, I have this, I have a playlist set up on my Plex server now um, for this. But on the, on StarWars.com, I think they, they may still have it. I'll look for it. Um, 
they have the actual like, okay, if you want to watch these in chronological order, here's the order to play all the episodes in. So, uh, yeah, that was, eh, that was what it was. But I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, they, they only do that for the first couple of three seasons, two and a half, I want to say. And, and then, then they realized they needed a greater overarching structure to tell the story they wanted to tell. Well, yeah, kind of, because the story kind of shifted into, the, the story shifted into events that were, yeah, best consumed in, in, in linear order, in chronological order. Um, just like what they were doing. They really started focusing on like the planet of Mandalore and um, it, it made the most sense to just kind of, you know, put everything on the chronological path at that point. But whatever. I mean, it's a darn fine series and, uh, and, and well worth the watch for the, uh, the seven seasons that are out there. Although I gather that season seven, which is airing right now, is more of a direct successor to season five than it is to season six. I don't have enough context to contribute on that, honestly. Well, th- like they'd initially, they had initially done like a five season run and then it got sort of soft canceled when Lucas sold to Disney. Oh, right. When they were trying to decide, what are we going to do with this property? But then Netflix financed a sixth season. But the sixth season is kind of some side stories, um, you know, sort of like B-side type material or like, you know, side stories that they hadn't really addressed. Um, and of course, the, the character of Ashoka is not- notably absent from season six, but then she's back for season seven. Um, so, Well, if I'm remembering correctly, considering how season five ended, it doesn't, it's not that great of a leap for her to have not been around in season six. <laughs> No, exactly, right? And it, it, it does work. So yeah, season six is not out of place in that sense. But like I say, I think season seven kind of picks up more and follows up on, you know, the aftermath of her departure from the Jedi Order. And uh, so that's where that's at. But yeah, still one of the more awesome Jedi characters I think that's ever been introduced into Star Wars lore. And possibly coming to live action, if rumors be true. You have some interesting background noise there, Helgraf. I'm not sure what's going on. That's almost certainly actually my father watching a movie in the next room over. Ah, indeed. Uh, it is so. surprisingly appropriate when I'm running a D&D game because the, the music often times nicely by more or less pure coincidence. There you go. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's all right then. Uh, I've not been doing any D&D games. Although that's true for the last 18 years. So, um, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time I played D&D? Maybe not 18 years ago. Probably sometime when I was still in Rover Scouts. I say. For me, it was Tuesday. Well, there you go. Uh, I, uh, I keep... see. Actually, for me, it was Tuesday as well, amusingly enough. <laughs> ha ha! <laughs> we tried to play over the weekend and Discord was having some pretty dramatic audio issues, so we had to reschedule the last uh, encounter. So we just ran one encounter Tuesday night. You know, I imagine that a lot of these um, services, whether it's Discord or, uh, you know, Zoom, of course, has been making the news lately as well. But uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But, you know, I imagine a lot of these services right now are like they're... I've seen this most in the educational apps, right? Because, of course, um, classes are being delivered uh, electronically now as well, right? Online and all that stuff. I mean, my kids have largely transitioned into the online learning just fine. But there's been a couple of times where, you know, uh, they've had to access this or that service because there's a whole bunch of them out there, right? I mean, everything is kind of loosely centered around Google Classroom, Google for Education. Well, there was a lot of not planned. So, yeah, there's a lot of yeah. people spinning it by ear, you know, just taking the first recommendation someone gives them, which is not always yeah. necessarily the best one for what they need to be doing. Well, I mean, that, but... Apparently, if security more, is an issue. <laughs> well, yeah, that too. But no, like, what what struck me the most is that, like, their teachers were very on the ball. You know, when, when things closed down here, um, well, they closed down just ahead of spring break, so that was nice. Um, and their teachers must have worked just feverishly over spring break so that when, you know, school would have resumed, it did. 
in an online capacity. And, you know, fortunately, I had enough extra tech laying about that I was able to make sure everybody had their own computer. Um, you know, we've got headsets and whatever else we need for, for people if they need to listen to something or do a video conference. They do constant, like, you know, Google Meet gets used so, so much. My My internet usage... I was looking at the graph of my internet usage, right? And I normally have like, you know, my idle month to month is in the 350 to 390 gigabyte range. For April so far, it's at like 1.5 terabytes. <laughs> and I mean, no data caps, amen for that. But like, oh my gosh, just the uh, the sheer quantity of like video conferences that they do. But sometimes daily, right? Each of, each of the three girls will have like almost daily video meets with their class or with you know one-on-ones with their teacher so and you know they have fun with it right like you know my youngest uh a couple of days ago decided to do her meet with her class from the trampoline in the backyard because <laughs> the way i have everything positioned the the most of the backyard actually gets pretty good wi-fi signal <laughs> for some dumb reason uh, are you sure this was a wise plan <laughs> You know, you know, I mean, they might as well have fun with it, right? You know, it's, um, it's, it, it breaks up the monotony of, you know, another day in the living room at any rate. But yeah, what I was struck by was just the, uh, the way in which, you know, some of the services that they were trying to access initially were fine, but as more and more schools, more and more school boards figured out their direction, like I say, ours was like, they were on the ball. And they were ready right out of the gate, right when spring break ended. Things picked up and they, the kids were learning again. And pretty much as normal or as normal as can be, given the current circumstances. But that hasn't been the, the you know, we've heard from other families that, you know, some school boards took several weeks to, or some schools took several weeks to get to that same point. And so the first few weeks, everything was pretty much copacetic. It was fine, you know, not a big deal. But just over the last week, especially some of the services that they've been trying to access, whether it's like, okay, well, go here and like, you know, go to this lesson and do like this math lesson, whatever. Um, those services haven't been accessible or they've been super laggy or whatever, right? Like, or my kids have had to access them at like odd hours of the evening. Um, and it all comes down to scalability, right? And this is kind of the problem that Zoom has had too. Yeah, it's that, you know, all of these services were built with a expectation of a certain audience size and operating within that certain audience size, they do well. But now all of a sudden they have to scale and have to scale very, very fast. And some are struggling and some are struggling a bit less, it would seem. Right. So, and then, but of course, you know, with the need to scale comes, yeah, you know, all of a sudden <laughs> various security issues are coming to light and, and other things are, I'm sure, cropping up as well. So, well, ugh. also a lot, well, a lot of it is uh, what I call um, RTFM. You've got people coming new into the software who just boot it right up. Don't bother customizing it or it's like, okay, we'll take the default security settings and not like change or or like institute a password you know what, what should be real basic stuff so yeah then you've got people who for whatever reason want to be giant jerks and they find these unguarded chats and wander in and do horrible things yeah, well yeah uh like i mean that's one thing i've noticed with with zoom as well right because you know when you set up a zoom account you have your personal meeting id essentially your zoom phone number right um and then, you know, individual meetings that you schedule can have a meeting specific ID and you can set a password or not set a password. And I think the password's on by default now, but it wasn't, you know, a month and a half ago. Um, and, you know, there's other settings that are not on by default, which are recommended to be enabled, like put the waiting room there, only allow certain people to share their screens, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's like one thing I do with my scouts is when we do our weekly virtual meetings, um, it's a new meeting ID every time. And I mean, we don't share the meeting ID publicly. Like there's a there's a bit of software called Scouts Tracker that Scouts Canada uses for, you know, so scout troops can manage records and schedule meetings and things like that. And it's all, you know, so the, the families of scouts can access Scouts Tracker, but it's all protected behind login portals and whatever else. And 
I mean, it's a web app. I'm sure there's ways that it could be exploited to, you know, reveal things like the Zoom meeting IDs, but we don't use the same meeting ID week to week. So that, you know, adds well, an yes, additional layer com of... Compromise is less because you're basically constantly flipping the channel. Basically, someone would have to get the ID and use it more or less concurrently. Exactly, right? And we only use it for an hour and then it's gone for good. So, I mean, it, there's no silver bullets and there never are. But eh, there, there are definitely steps you can take to make yourself less vulnerable to some of the bizarre and interesting nastiness that has cropped up in the wake of, yeah, all of a sudden this sudden surge in people using video conferencing software. Um, but again, a lot of that comes down to just like in Zoom's case, a lot of it just comes down to um, actually reading through the settings, going through the settings and... You know, just like, oh, okay, that, you know, yeah, you're right. Maybe I don't want just everybody to be able to share their screen. Maybe only the host. Maybe I do want to have a waiting room and then I, can, I as the host, can manually allow people into the meeting rather than just having everybody auto-join. Crazy talk. Yeah. Indeed. Well, that's the same with... Put uh, it on the table. Bah, there you go. Get back! Bah. But I, uh, I mean, I've been using Zoom. Well, gosh, like we use Zoom for just about, we use Zoom a lot, actually. Like, I mean, my, if it's my side of the family, like my sisters and my grandparents, my brother, um, they still use Google Hangouts. And um, for, for the school stuff, the kids all use Google Meet, which apparently is, if it isn't already, is very soon going to be accessible to us common folk. You won't need a G Suite or a Google Education account to... Uh, mm -hmm to start a meet so there's that um but yeah we use zoom for a lot like you know the uh every sunday now at around noon um so like my wife and i i mean obviously we don't we don't regularly go to the parish the catholic parish that we met at but we when the churches were still open around here we tried to get back there about once a month because we still have a lot of friends who, uh, you know, that is their regular community that they worship at on Sundays. And, you know, even though, of course, we go to the church, the, the Catholic church is now much closer to our home and that's tied to the kids' school. Like I say, we still have a lot of friends at the parish we met at. So we go there, you know, once a month, if we can manage it once every couple of months. And it's, it's actually like, it's, it's a parish and a chapel tied to a theological college in the middle of the University of Alberta. So, in addition to everything else, it has a residence. And because it has a residence, the basement has a cafeteria. And for a nominal fee, non-students can go down to the cafeteria on Sunday and have a really quite enjoyable and delicious brunch. And so that's kind of the habit. We go there, and then after, after Mass, we go for brunch. And all of our friends will kind of join us at the table, and we'll just kind of hang out and chat and whatever else. So this group of people... You know, every Sunday now we have a Zoom meeting at about noon. So, you know, everybody like cooks up a really nice brunch at home and then we just kind of sit and eat and chat and it's fun. Um, or like I say, for the scouts, we use it for the scouts. Uh, my wife uses it for a couple of groups. She's part of actually, she had a, the CBC, Canada's, you know, national broadcaster uses Zoom for uh, interviews and stuff. Mm-hmm. That was that was a surreal moment. Um, she, my wife, had a an interview with uh, the CBC today. Kind of just came up entirely by happenstance. Um, but you know, uh, there's a there's a TV series that she enjoys called Murdoch Mysteries, which is like it's sort of a it's a police procedural, um, but it's set in like the early days of Canada. Uh, so, you know, it's like, it's like a period piece, but it's like, you know, a police procedural. So it's got, you know, it's a pretty fun show. Apparently, um, I haven't checked out too, too many episodes, but I've enjoyed the ones that I have seen, but somehow she ended up kind of, she likes to research actors in shows. Um, mm -hmm. and so she, you know, was researching the, the main actor who plays constable or detective Murdoch in the show. And, um, of course he has been posting a lot to, the Murdoch Mysteries Facebook page into his Instagram profile, uh, you know, just little videos, kind of just trying to be like inspirational and, you know, encouraging to people really trying to, you know, you know, doing the whole fostering positivity thing. But one of the uh, things that he posted at one point was asking 
uh, in the current parlance, frontline workers to share their stories. And my wife, being a nurse, uh, certainly falls under that label. And so she uh, and she shared, you know, a very particular story that uh, I, I guess, you know, the the social media team for the Murdoch Mysteries found quite meaningful. And so did this actor. And so the social media team reached out to her and they're just like, hey, that was, you know, like, we were really moved by your story. And, you know, we'd like to actually chat with you about it. And they, so they set up an interview that was today. And then like five minutes in, um, this actor basically like they, they pulled him in kind of, you know, made it seem like a bit of a zoom bomb, uh, I guess. Right. Uh-huh. And so then they wound up talking for about half an hour and that was kind of cool, but just, it's like, wow, even the national broadcaster of Canada uses zoom because of course they do all sorts of, uh, I mean, it's good tech. Like it's the appeal of it is that you don't need an account to join a meeting. And that's so handy. Because mm-hmm. you get people like me who are like, yeah, sure, I can maintain 300. What's my one password database up to right now? It's some ridiculous <laughs> number. It's like probably crested 400 by now. Um, different accounts at different web services. I should probably prune it because some of them don't even exist anymore. But, uh, and then you get other people who are like, oh God, I got to sign up for one more damn thing. Like, what the hell is this? So, Zoom fits nicely into the wheelhouse of that latter group because they don't even need to sign in. They just, they get the meeting ID and they're in and that's it. But anyways, oh my goodness. I don't know if I want this to be the Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah. I will say though that uh, I have been enjoying a slightly increased opportunity to, to check out video games again. Not that uh, not that I'm any closer to passing Mass Effect Andromeda, but um, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm slowly working on it. But uh, I kind of I kind of split time between Mass Effect Andromeda and the Halo series because, of course, um, I subscribed to Game Pass for uh, Windows 10, and so I've been checking out Halo through that because they're slowly porting all the Halo games. To, well quote slowly unquote they're very rapidly they expect to have them all ported by the end of the year i don't know if that's still going to be true now you know, i could see <laughs> my own experience of working from home has been that it kind of slows me down a little bit so if 343 industries is in that situation i could totally see them being uh you know may, maybe 2021 is the new 2020 i don't know but uh, i mean it is for me yeah well yeah that's right yeah you uh you you uh recently announced your postponement so yeah and it, it's because i am finding it more difficult to be productive yeah well yeah actually i, I meant to ask you that because like what was your working circumstance before like when you were sitting down to do dark unknown stuff like i, I guess i guess or i guess more correctly like you know because this is one thing that i don't recall seeing as much in your news post about that was like what obviously the big change was that we're all social distancing and isolating at home but like what in that was sort of what where where does the delay come in right versus how Uh, you would have worked on the dark unknown prior to now yeah nothing technologically changed um you know i did 99 percent of my work from my home desktop which is also now the device that i work work from um I kind of wish I could uh, go up to my office and grab. I own two laptops. I have a really weak travel laptop that can barely handle having like two things open at a time uh, that I have at home. And then I have, you know, what I bought as a gaming laptop back when I was raiding in WoW Burning Crusade, but it's still actually an entirely respectable machine. It can run like Mm -hmm. Civ 6 fine, but it lives at my office. Uh-huh. And I haven't been back to the office since getting off the cruise ship. Ah, uh-huh. of so, course, yes. Uh, I would have to go and drive up to Berkeley and sneak into the office sometime that nobody else was there, uh, and uh, and grab it. And I've just been too lazy. Um, but so I'm working on the same device. I'm working roughly the same times that I would be. It's entirely a purely psychological level of 
finding it significantly more difficult to just be motivated to get much of anything done um, instead of just being a useless piece of shit and playing video games. <laughs> so I've been playing more Civ and Stellaris. Uh, I've picked Martian Dreams back up at least. I uh, started playing Dragon Wars because I never finished that back on the Commodore. Um, and uh, um, so it's just an acceptance that um, I am not going to like, I'm going to take a moment uh, on any given evening or whatever. And I'm going to say, okay, I should really get at least one small thing done and try to build on some momentum or something, but I'm going to undertake at least enough self care as the kids say these days uh, to not, really push it more than it has to and to to let myself deal with uh the the current uh word which is not to be spoken circumstance uh of not having a day a week that two friends come over and we play gloomhaven once a week and not having people that i see in person to play D D uh and all of that and instead you know being where we are now uh, it's just been harder to to be productive, and I'm at a I'm I'm currently at kind of a difficult stretch on things because uh, I'm actually kind of back to a very early stage of things. In as much as you know, I've got the main plot plotted out and specked out, and I might not know details entirely like i just today figured out exactly how you get access to a couple of spells um and that's actually what i was doing before i i jumped into this um and but you know like that's that's one thing but then i decided that i was going to add those seven random caves on the map just to you know reward it. exploration and have a little more stuff going on that's not plot related but that means i need to figure out what's in them all and so i'm back to square one on designing new content right yeah because you're essentially inventing seven dungeons out of whole cloth yeah i mean they're smaller than that but uh or at least they can be um but uh i'm kind of iteration, uh, iteration. <laughs> back to back to blank page uh on those so i i alternate between trying to come up with stuff on that spent a little while talking to an old writing group that i was in trying to uh, figure out how to write this mystery plot i had this idea i thought was a great idea but then i've literally had it in the idea stage for years and haven't managed to come up with details i've got this prisoner in the basement of the main castle in the prison there there's three prison cells and two of them get occupied by rebels that are part of the main plot. And then one of them is just this dude who's like, I'm innocent. I'm, I swear I'm innocent. Can you help me? And I had the idea that I was going to generate a random seed when you start your character and have his mystery play out differently, depending on which one you get. Like maybe he's innocent. Maybe he's guilty. Maybe he was framed kind of like mm. three options just to have there be something that's different. If you replay but then right. coming up with a mystery that... Then you're coming up with potentially like three different mysteries or more, right. depending on how many seeds you're possibly, planting. It would possibly be easier to do it as just three completely different mysteries um, and have like his dialogue be straight up different from the get-go. But I kind of wanted it to be like the first two or three steps are the same and then the details start changing and so the conclusions you draw... And combine right. that with the difficulty of handling a mystery with single keyword entry for dialogue, which makes it a lot harder to do like the summation, as it were. Um, so I just haven't come up with how to actually plot that one out. Um, I've had some ideas, but I haven't really finished that one. But then I actually I realized I went, you know what? I wrote a small video game level mystery for Hobloff 3. Because I ran a 13 part story at that, you know, week long LARP. 
uh, that had a segment for each virtue, a segment for each anti-principle, and then the final battle with uh, uh, the Guardian trying to resurrect himself. Um, and the Justice one was just this little mystery. And I went, I looked at it, and like, I could actually rewrite this a little bit. Like, it doesn't work at all for the dude in the prison. But you can but, use it elsewhere. But I could use it elsewhere, and I'm going to have, as I mentioned in my, in my latest post that uh, the Codex picked up, uh, it had been my intention for quite a while that at the end of Act 1, when the Civil War ends, uh, I'm going to add one or two NPCs to each town that are soldiers returning home from duty. Hmm. But I have no particular plans for most of them. So it's going to be just making up random crap. And I have an awful lot of content that came up because I just started writing shit in somebody's dialogue and it went somewhere. And I was like, okay, I guess that's this person's side quest. You, you started asking questions and filling in the blanks, regardless of whether, regardless of whether it's particularly implementable. <laughs> I mean, that's a very origin philosophy though. Right. I mean, I, how by did, the way, uh, there, I, I, I do like your little three different potential issues for the prisoner thing, because <laughs> If you were to do this like just two or three times overall in the game, you would throw off so many people trying to build like a walkthrough guide for your game. Because <laughs> they, yeah. uh, they, they might never even realize what had happened. That's an, that's an interesting thing that I hadn't thought about, but um, you know, I do want to eventually have a hint book, uh, and I want it to be in the style of the you know later Ultima Hint books, the ones after Dr. Katz got his paws on them and they started being a you know short story with right, yeah. either a section at the end or interstitial sections that give you the actual like mechanical stuff. Um and I actually, I don't even know if she remembers because I talked to her like five and a half years ago, but I approached Shadow of Light Dragon and asked if I would, might be able to commission it from her um, just because I admire her fanfic so much. Um, Talented writer, for sure. Yeah. And uh, it, it hadn't occurred to me that we would have to pick one of the branches uh, to be what happens in the story version, but obviously uh, there can be a non-story section of the hint book that says, if you get this, it's this. If you get this, it's this. If you get this, it's this. And yeah, I would like there to be a couple more. I haven't thought of what they could be. Um, but, uh, and after a certain point, like it was on my list of, it'd be neat if I had like three different things that looked at that seed, but that factored the seed differently. Uh, so. So any so if there's three different things that each have three different possibilities, it's not always one 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 two 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 three three three, um, uh, you know, and that's easy enough. Um, but when I got to the point where feature creep had already eaten, you know, years of dev time. I mean, NPC schedules literally ate an entire year of dev time. Uh, I got to the point where I'm like, if I think of something great. But at the moment, that's not priority to come up with these things. Makes sense. You know, I figure I will get to a point where um, the base game and most of the side fluff is done, and I've got it out at playtesters, and that's where I have the opportunity to, I can't release yet, but any given day where somebody hasn't come to me with a bug report or a complaint, I can try to add a little more fluff. That's kind of how I'm thinking of it. I don't know how that'll work. Uh, I might just start playing video games again at that point. But <laughs> yeah, well, if uh... out of curiosity regarding yes. these uh, like extra caves slash mini dungeons, like they, they, you know, rewards for the explorers. I mean, depending, I'm not sure how involved the process is, but depend how personally attached you are but have you considered i don't know subcontracting 
Maybe have someone else bang you out of cave system. I mean, you'd know, you'd know how to code it directly into the game itself, obviously, but just like... I mean, uh, I get wary because like real early in the process, when I first started and I first built my map editor and I made like my first town, which I've you know thrown out and redone years hence, um, and I posted it on, and, and this is going to date things, on my live journal, um, where, wow. where my first, you know, year or two of me talking about dev stuff was, um, I had a number of people who said that they were going to poke around in the map editor and like make me a town or make me something. And not a single one of them actually followed through. Um, so like I could hire somebody to ensure that like it actually happened. Um, but I would need to get a little more stymied um, before that's where my limited indie budget was going to go. Um, I'm in pursuit of uh, trying to throw money at somebody to make me a tile set. And I don't know if that's going to actually happen or not. Um, I need to send a follow-up email and see if the scope of things scared off the artist that I'm talking to. Um, Because, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to just replace a subset, but, um, I mean, or a subset at a time or whatever based on availability. But uh, I, when I, when I, found an artist that I was started talking to and he surprised me by saying, yes, actually I'm, I might have time for that when I said, Hey, I'm looking for this. Um, and, uh, so I made a web page that has all of the tiles currently in my game and what they currently look like. Now here's the thing for years, I decided I wasn't going to do exactly what I'm trying to do right now. I decided I wasn't going to wind up, having the money, spending the money on a unique tile set for Dark Unknown. Um, And it was partially when I more recently came to the decision that the game is not going to be straight up free, as had been for a long time my intention. It's going to be pay what you want, so anybody who wants it for free can still get it that way. But it's no longer a completely free thing. And maybe someday, especially if I deport it to Unity, maybe I'll connive my way onto steam who knows um but uh santiago slashing dragon points out to me that at that level using this kind of shared tile set will straight up cost you sales um and people be just like hey i've seen that before yeah and you know once i have a tile set like it had kind of been my intention that i've just finished this project and then try to get a unique tile set either for the unity port or just for the sequels, assuming that I go on to do sequels and I do have ideas. Um, but so I decided I'm going to poke around and see what I can do about tiles. And I need to do it sooner rather than later because I need to have at least the terrain tiles and like NPCs in towns and some of the monster tiles looking like mostly how they're going to look so I can have screenshots for the player reference guide and for the box. I can't finish designing those and publishing those until I know what the game is going to look like at the end, unless I want to set up an entire player reference guide that doesn't actually show the game looking like the game looks like. Um, so I made that website. And the, but the thing is, as I was, as I decided I wasn't going to be doing this, wasn't going to try to get tiles. Every time I found another free to use roguelike tile set, uh, you know, Dungeon Crawl, Stone Soup, Ang Band, uh, Dawn something or another, um, or I find, you know, a 50 cent asset on game dev market, I'm just like, eh. I have no memory restrictions. I'm not uh, Nox Archaeist or Unknown Realm. I'm not constrained to 64K of memory and floppy drives. Uh, So I just kept adding stuff and adding stuff. 
And now I have a tile set that's about three times the size of Ultima Five. <laughs> Impressive. So, so now it's significantly more expensive to upgrade. And uh, any given artist that looks at the project is possibly going to, as may have happened in this case, I don't know, look at my page of things and go, yeah, no. Even though I was upfront on that page that I'm happy to, to do this in chunks and am not expecting somebody to commit to all of the chunks in advance or anything, and I chunked them out. Like I've got, here's the terrain. Here's items, etc. So uh, one thing that I would really like if I were to do this is uh, being able to do the little mini paper doll kind of effect. Uh, so instead of having the Ultima 4 upgrade project tiles for my monsters and townsfolk, um, the only upgrade I have for townsfolk is a bunch of palette swaps for things, is you know having a townsfolk graphic that animates in a specific way, and then a hammer graphic, a sword graphic, an axe graphic, et cetera, that I just place on top, the way that Angband builds your character based on showing what you're holding and what you're wearing. Uh, if you if you use some of the later, uh, or I'm not sure if Angband does it, but a lot of the roguelikes, the tile-based roguelikes, uh, build your character that way by just masking things on top of each other. Uh, and my engine can totally do that as of the most recent rewrite for it. And that would dramatically improve uh, the player seeing their character as, you know, being what they're doing instead of, I'm going to use the Paladin graphic. Um, but it also would let me, since mix and match would uh, combinatorially, is that a word? Uh, increase the number the, the variety uh it becomes easier in a game where the graphics are as pulled back as this is to tell one npc from another and that's a big problem that i have is i have like six people in town that are all the generic citizen graphic and i'm like should i make one of these a fighter just so they're more you know distinct so, you, so the player isn't constantly using the look command to see who's who. Um, and having uh, added, literally just taking that citizen graphic and creating versions with three different color shirts has helped. Uh, I got Dom John to do that one for me. Um, but uh, I really like, I really want to get this done because I made the mistake at this point, you know, two years ago of paying for InDesign on a monthly basis instead of a year at a time because I hoped to have everything I was going to do in InDesign done within eight months. Uh, um, that being the art book, the almanac, and the player reference guide. And the player reference guide is the only thing that's left of that, but it's on hold until I get the graphic situation sorted out. It's a mess, and I wish I had more people on the project, but I don't really also don't really want to bring more people in on the project at this point, just so when I'm done, I can say I did the whole goddamn thing myself, even though I did hire people for art, so that's already a uh, 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 misleading statement. For sure. You've done a substantial amount of the project yourself, though. You're trying to keep it that way. Yes. And sound effects, I also have uh, either paid for or mostly gotten off of um, demo and promo things from GDC and such. Because I just and and a handful from uh, uh, well, I'm gonna feel bad. I'm basing on his name. Uh, participated in a lot of the early podcasts of this. Was making that uh, UO dragon. What's that? No, you're not talking about Boolean dragon. No, Mo is never on the podcast here. Hang on, yeah, I've no. got a master list of most of the people who ever contributed to the podcast here. So let's see. Uh, there was Boolean. Linguistic was on fairly early on. Um, Is Boolean Gradia. the one who was making the multiplayer game for a while and then went off and started making that uh, shmup game that he kickstarted? That was and Boolean. As as that was never Boolean. Finished? Yeah, What's that was that? Boolean. Yeah, so that Boolean. Boolean. I'm using some sound effects from his uh, UO-esque project when he went out and 
actually took a microphone and stepped in gravel and stepped in sand a whole bunch. Uh, so some of my footsteps come from his project from doing that. I remember him doing that. He's pretty, he's pretty particular about such things. Yeah, I haven't seen him like around posting to Facebook, active on Discord or anything for a while. Yeah, I I don't know what's become of him lately too. I should really check in with him. Uh, I mean, I know, you know, he had some family side stuff going on, and they like they tried to launch the other podcast that they were doing, the, uh, the CRT enthusiast or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and I imagine with you know the family stuff that he had going on, and now in the current circumstance of you know <laughs> the world going crazy, um, he's probably. Um, oh, he has a lot going on. A lot going on is just one more of those people who's like just adapting to the new normal. Yeah. Or trying to. Yeah, that's fair. But yes, aside from that, all of the, I mean, it's funny. Like I can say I wrote all the story and that's true, but you know, an awful lot of it uh, wouldn't be as good as it is if it weren't for a couple of particular people that, uh, are my main sounding boards for bouncing stuff off of or the writing group or stuff. I guess that's what the special thanks section is for. I'm just yeah, well, I'm yeah. just going to say um, that's more common than you might realize. Oh, I know. Like, nothing happens in a vacuum. Nobody does things with no influences at all. Sure. Um, at a certain level, I get the whole I want to put forth that uh, this was Regardless of the presence of midwives and or doctors, this was my baby thing. Right. At the same time, you want that baby to live eventually. That's part of it. And I mean... That is true, though. It sounds weirdly dark. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I was trying to avoid the the other analogy I've used to describe this situation because it involves a small amount of profanity. But, you know. That's fine. Well, like, I can make the analog, you know, with the stuff that I do for to support my team at work, right? It's... Yes, I can say, not untruthfully, that, you know, the apps that support the team, you know, were all things that I developed. But, like, equally, I mean, a lot of the stuff that ends up in the app ends up there because I have people on the team throw a weird situation at me that I somehow have to figure out how to deal with, you know? It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I was trying to use the app in this circumstance and this was what happened, you know, versus this being the expected result. It's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, even something simple like um, how the C Sharp API, if you're using the UTF-8 character set, handles, or in this case, or the C Sharp XML API, C Sharp XML API, if you're using um, UTF-8, will crash and crash hard if uh, it's trying to, like, if its inputs are, say, on Espanol, and now it's trying to write those inputs to XML tags on the output side, um, because certain of the characters that may crop up in the text stream are invalid within UTF-8 in the XML spec. So, you know, just... Silly things like that, right? I mean, yes, it's... I, I accept that every word you just said is 100% true. Yes, it's all very <laughs> techno babbly. But the point is, you know, you, you build these things, and yes, you're the person who built them, but they are improved and honed and made better by the contributions of others. And that's not a bad thing, because at the end of the day, you know, you are one person and you are very talented as one person. Um, but no one is a master of everything. So, you know, it, there, there are inevitably things that, you know, one will do that, uh, or there, there, there are inevitably things that, you know, one will do that, oh, I totally didn't even think of this other circumstance that you've now brought to my attention, or I totally didn't even think about approaching the problem from that angle. That actually makes so much more sense. And, uh, let's do it that way instead. Yep. Or, uh, you know, having people that are better or uh, better programmers than you in general or, uh, you know, have experience with specific things. Like finding somebody who knew their way around Node, uh, finding somebody who finally managed to get uh, unit-driven testing, 
through my head, stuff like that. Uh, yes, there are unit tests for DU. I'm sure there are. I mean, not with, nearly with as many as my unit test uh, programmer friend thinks there should be. Because uh, when, well, you know, when you have a, a hexagonal EBITDA, everything starts to look like a nut. Yeah, well, yeah. Seriously, this will work for you. Let me tell you how, where, where should, you should be implementing this in your project. Here, here's the code. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, gosh, there's been a few times where, yeah, like I've been working on a thing at work and, you know, someone has basically just walked right up and completely upended the entire apple cart for me with some sort of suggestion of, hey, you know, maybe you should do it this way instead. And, uh, oh, heck, I just had that realization the other day, you know, based on something my manager said. It's just like, oh, okay, wait a minute. Um, you're right. We could totally do that better if we did that this way that I've actually been putting off and not wanting to implement for some years now. <laughs> I have been totally sidestepping. That's well, kind of correct. <laughs> yes. Indeed. We don't turn the ship. We just rotate the universe around it. Yeah, almost. Um, I, well, and you know, it was the Spanish language thing, actually, that really tripped that up. Because it's uh, it's like, oh, okay, so when we're processing this in, you know, when we're processing this in Spanish, it's certain labels that I'm depending on as search strings are, in fact, ending up... Um, it was language syntax. Right. You know, they, they pop up in a completely different language and it's like, okay, well, I can't, you, you I run can't into, rely you're, on you're, that. Yeah. I can't search like, for that anymore because now that's obviously going to change based on language settings, local language settings on the PC that I'm collecting yeah. data from. Yeah, yeah, but you run into a, an unfortunate variant of the old Jimmy drop tables problem. <laughs> yeah. But then, um, you know, the the tool that we're collecting data with that I'm then trying to process um, has two outputs, and I've been avoiding developing support for the second output because it's <laughs> it's more complex and there aren't as nice APIs for browsing through it. But but within that output, there are things that I could pivot my searches off of, which are immutable regardless of the language setting they will always always turn up in uh well, i can't really say in english because they're they're more like uh they're more like property strings right so nominally the words that comprise them are english but you know like whatever the point is they won't change based on language because they are hard coded right. into the output versus things like uh certain titles right system overview will come out as vista general in Spanish. I can't change that, but I can use this other data that is immutable that I just have been avoiding touching since 2013. What do you do? Well, goodness. I don't know where Harmony Dragon is. You comment yeah. a whole lot of you comment a whole lot of code and hope for the best. Oh my gosh, the last update I pushed for that app, I was just I I cut it down 20%. Okay. Knocked about 20% off the the resulting file size uh, of the executable. Just because I wound up deleting something eight, like eight acres of comments, classes. I was deleting whole classes. I deleted about thirty classes and a bunch of functions from it as well. Stuff that we weren't using anymore. No one will need this purge. <laughs> well, literally. I mean, nobody uses Linux and control systems anymore. Well, I shouldn't say that because people do still occasionally, but um, vanishingly I'm, few. <laughs> I'm just gonna say uh, the U.S. government exists. Well, okay, they, well, I don't know if they're, I don't know how much Linux I'd find there. I mean, I would expect to find like have, systems running on COBOL. Uh, among other things, I've got a couple of friends who have a certain level of clearance who do contract work for the government. And yeah, I've, I've heard some fascinating war stories about the systems and the things they have to do to try and get data from one set of systems to the other. Well, like as not the darn things keep running. And in that way, the government is not so different from private industry because, you know, 
if I'm building a power plant and I want to run the power plant for 30 odd years, well, as long as the control system keeps running it, why would I change the control system? The trouble, of course, is finding find, find, finding people whose biological control systems still allow them to, into, to, to come in and do the work when something, right. when, something go, when something goes frog. Right? This is a hell of a time to be... This is a hell of a time to be a young COBOL programmer. This is a hell of a time to have been like the young nerdy kid who, for whatever reason, developed an interest in COBOL and has some experience with the language. Because literally yes, there's like a bunch of U.S. Eastern Seaboard states who want to talk to you right now. <laughs> Yes, but before this, you were looking at like probably ninety-seven percent chance of being unemployed. <laughs> exactly right. So it's, it's, survive, it's just... Surviving long enough to reach the crisis point is usually not a good plan method. No, no. I guess more like a cobalt hobbyist. You know, a young cobalt hobbyist would would have a, an interesting some interesting employment prospects right now. But well, and that'll be other languages. I'm sure there'll there'll be a point where you know even something as as uh, as venerable as C will, you know, be in that, uh, will occupy roughly the same space that COBOL occupies. And all of a sudden there'll be demand for people who can remember how to program in this ancient and archaic structured programming language called C that uh, nobody uses anymore, except for all of these really critical systems that have been using it for the last 40 years and uh, are failing. Which is funny because one of the reasons they stuck with it is because it wasn't supposed to be <laughs> Well, I mean, everything fails. You, it's just you can't, what's your you mean time to failure. You can't escape obsolescence. No, everything fails. It's just what's your mean time to failure, you know? If, if you're measuring your mean time to failure in decades and half centuries, um, <laughs> you probably do it all right. You know, try keep a Windows installation running for 40 years straight. Just find yourself a nice stable build that's no longer supported by Microsoft, so you don't have to worry about their patches uh, taking you offline. Yeah, and they just never connected to the internet, anyways, because you know it's unpatched. <laughs> Anything unpatched these days is terrible. I'm just saying, if your operating system's old enough, the viruses <laughs> have an interesting <laughs> conundrum. They're designed to attack more sophisticated software than what you're running. True, true. Although, I mean. <laughs> Well, well, that's true, true and not right. I mean, yeah, like if you're if you're up against someone who's like purpose building for a particular thing, then yes, you know, if you put something in their path that is not the thing they're expecting, sure, it'll trip them up. But here the comes the end, here comes the worm software. Yep. It's there's no shell for it to interact. What happened? <laughs> but you know, on the other hand, I mean, it's you know, it's not hard to get yourself uh, a copy of the Metasploit database, and all of a sudden. Hey, look, all of these, uh, hey, oh, okay, I can fingerprint that host. Oh, it's running this Windows OS. Oh, look, here's this whole encyclopedia of vulnerabilities I have for even the latest and greatest patched version of that OS. <laughs> and uh, away you go. But uh, I mean, I, I was having this discussion with um, Rustic Dragon the other day because he was bemoaning the fact that his Plex player client updated and would no longer connect to his Plex server, which was not as updated, right? Client server version mismatch. And Plex is somewhat tolerant of this, but only to a point that he had crossed that threshold. Uh, and we are, no, we, are, we, are, we are no longer at the point where we are even shaking our pinky fingers. Good day, sir. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of pointed out that, like, my Plex server, I just, I have a script, like, there's, I have a script on it that basically just keeps Plex the the server component up to date checks daily if there's been an update downloads it installs it restarts if necessary um and that's fine and i mean like it's just it's a linux box sitting across the house so i have other scripts that are keeping the os up to date right they just fire off the the update commands on on a schedule so not a big deal for me you know plex client updates on my phone i don't care my server's up to date anyways and, you know, Rustic's reply, and he, I mean, he was, you know, not, he's not wrong to be concerned about, you know, running additional scripts, especially scripts that were based on the work of a third party uh, on my home server. You know, there, there is obviously the risk, there is some additional security risk there. But my comment back to him is just like, okay, yeah, but what's the greater security risk? My modified variant of a third party script or having my server and my client software, which are internet connected right like they're 
they're putting themselves out there online, keeping those deliberately out of date so that I can maintain a particular operation at a level that I like. I know what side of the fence I come down on. This is my line of work. <laughs> right. But, uh, but yeah, whatever. You see these trade-offs made a lot in government. You see it made a lot in industry too. It's like, well, on the one hand, yeah, you know, I mean, we should update it because yeah, this thing here is decades old and, you know, the vendor doesn't even exist anymore. So obviously they're not supporting it anymore, but on the other hand, it keeps working. <laughs> right. <laughs> why, 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 why fix what isn't critically broken? Well, why spend, yeah, especially if it's going to cost you, you know, more than your usual, um, Operations project budget. budget. Yeah, your project budget for the year, right? Oh. Uh, well, I don't know where Harmony is, but I worry that I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. So uh, I think perhaps I shall bid you gentlemen good evening. Fair enough. I'll uh, hmm. get back to... Go go write an NPC that. or a dungeon or something like that. Yeah, no, no, I'm uh, I'm, I'm dungeon I'm, is the NPC. Aha! <laughs> I have NPC to add merchant data too. Ah, there you go. The dungeon will sell you the wares from from from, from inside its own depths. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming I stop playing the game of Civ Six that I've had going on in the background of talking deal. That is a tough call. I I totally sympathize. That is a tough yeah. call. I just I just got into a war. I mean, uh, yeah, you can't really walk away from that. Uh, no. Uh, who did I get into a war with today? Uh, Congo. Well, you know, I'll just pay him off in bananas. <laughs> Not King Congo. Different. No, I was thinking the silverback gorillas with lasers. There's a data reference for you. <laughs> Attached to their heads? No, no. Freaking laser beams. Uh, Freaking laser so, beams, uh, powered by some we some by some weird unobtainium di diamonds that they also had in the Congo, apparently. Yeah, no, well, no, I'm just saying, like you know, I took your reference and then went with you know another reference. <laughs> Referenceception. Yes, exactly. Scott, 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 Scott. WTF? You just don't get it. Uh, all right. Well, on that cheery note, I bid you gentlemen good night, and uh, good night. We shall talk again see, at some point. See, see you next time. Well, Bye -bye. given my typical recording rate, probably in a sometime in next year. Hey, we might not be in lockdown by then, though. So there's that. This changes nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Is everyone still isolated at home? Good. Okay. Good. Nothing's changed. <laughs> If you want to join the Ultima Dragons, you can do so at udic.org, where at you can choose your very own dragon name. You can also find the Ultima Dragons on Facebook. We have a Facebook group there. And you can follow at Ultima Dragons on Twitter or join them on Discord. And if you're feeling really old school, you can even fire up a Telnet client and check out the Wearmount. Hit up the show notes for links to all of these. If you want to participate more directly in the podcast, you can send us an email. Or if you're feeling a little bit braver, leave us a voice message in one of three places, the podcast website, our Facebook page, or on anchor.fm. And you're also welcome to join us on our Discord server to chat with us, to lurk, or even contribute to podcast recordings when they happen. And again, links in the show notes. If you'd like to support Spam 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 Humbug, you can do so at patreon.com slash ultimacodex, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get access to episodes the day before they go live to the general public. You'll also get access to behind-the-scenes audio when we have some to share, and possibly other interesting content. But we also welcome your moral support. You can like the Ultima series on Facebook, follow at Ultima Codex on Twitter, or leave the podcast a review on iTunes. And you're also welcome to share our episodes with your friends and social media circles. Spam 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 Humbug is a production of the Ultima Codex. You can find show notes online at spam 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 humbug.com. Thank you for listening, and until next time, be virtuous. Thank you.